Hey everyone, it's Berm, and this is Level Zero Networking. In part two of this series, we configured the router to talk to the ISP and secured that connection with a firewall filter. If you haven't watched that video yet, I recommend checking it out now. Just like our external or WAN interface, we need to identify our internal interface. If you've labeled your interfaces or you only have two, then you should know which one is for the LAN. If you aren't sure, then you can just connect the device to the interface and see which interface comes up. To do that, do a show interfaces before plugging it in and then again after. In this video, we'll be using ETH2 for our LAN interface. And as you can see, our interface is up down. Now I'll go ahead and plug the cable in. And ETH2 is now up up or U slash U. Now, if your switch is capable of doing VLANs, then I recommend setting them up from the start. This will allow for your wireless and wired connections to be on different subnets. It allows for different security postures on each network and also limits broadcast traffic from your wireless to your wired network. I'm gonna assume that most users don't have a VLAN supported switch. However, I am gonna go over the configuration for VLANs and then switch to non-VLANs. Now, no matter if you're using VLANs or not, you'll wanna delete DHCP off your interface before moving forward. To do this, we need to go into configuration mode. Now we'll delete DHCP off. At this point, if you aren't using VLANs, go ahead and skip to the non-VLAN section of the interface configuration. Now we're gonna configure the LAN interface similar to the WAN interface, but we'll apply our configuration under a virtual interface. The VIF portion stands for virtual interface, and the number after VIF is the associated VLAN. In order to account for adding a VLAN, we're gonna lower our MTU, or maximum transmission unit, from 1500 to 1496. This is because the VLAN will use four bytes of our available 1500. As usual, let's give our interfaces a useful description. This will help when you need to go back and look at it another time. We're gonna run a compare commands. Now your config should look similar to mine. If it does, then let's go ahead and commit and save. We do wanna proceed. And now we'll confirm the configuration and save it. Let's verify our interfaces using the show interfaces command again. In our interfaces, you'll notice we have ETH2, ETH2.10, and ETH2.20. This is because we created two virtual interfaces under our physical interface for the VLANs. I'm gonna delete this config now and configure our router without VLANs. Now to the non-VLAN section. As you can see, this configuration looks very similar, but without the VIF. I'm gonna go ahead and commit this configuration. Now once more, we're gonna go ahead and verify that our interface is configured using the show interfaces command. You can see ETH2 is configured and we no longer have the VIF underneath of it. Now that we're adding a trusted interface, we need to update our firewall rules. We'll be updating the forward and input rules. For both the input and the forward, we're gonna be using rule 1000 so as to keep our accept all rules out of the way. This will let us add rules before the accept all rule if needed. Now we're gonna to go to the input rules. These will be exactly the same as the forward rules. We'll also need to add the interface to our previously created flow table, FT1. Now let's go ahead and verify everything looks good before we commit. Everything seems to be what we put in, so we'll go ahead and commit. Now, before any host can use the router, we need to add a DHCP pool so they can automatically pull an IP address. We assign the 10.0.10.0 slash 24 network on our LAN interface, so we'll create a subnet ID for that pool. We'll name the pool users and add the 10.0.10.0 slash 24 subnet with an ID of two. Now we'll designate the router IP under options for the clients. And now to set the DHCP range. These are the IPs that are available for DHCP to assign to clients. You may wanna save some address space for static assignment. Printers are a good example of something that you might wanna have a static IP for. After that, we need to tell the users what DNS server to use. I'll be setting mine to 4.2.2.2, similar to what we set the router. I do wanna go ahead and mention that these commands are for 1.5 and there are slight differences with 1.4. Mostly just don't put stuff like default router and name server under option and you don't need the subnet ID. Now in order for your private IP address on your local network to talk to the internet, you need to implement a feature called network address translation or NAT. This will replace our internal IP address with the public facing IP on the router. This specific type of NAT is called source NAT or SNAT. First thing we'll do is define our external interface inside of a source NAT rule. Next, we need to specify what IP we want our address to be. For this, we'll use a feature called masquerade. 
This just replaces the source IP with that of the interface the traffic is going out of. It's masquerading as the external IP. And as usual, we'll set a description so we know what the rule is for. Let's go ahead and verify our commands again. Since everything looks good, we'll go ahead and commit and save. Now, once we connect a host, we should pull an IP address. To verify it's working, we can run show DHCP server leases. As you can see, I have two leases. That's because I plugged in an Ubuntu desktop and also my current desktop. Now for my host, we'll see my IP address. As you can see, I've received the 10.11 address from the router. Now we'll try to ping the internet. And success, we're able to get to the internet. Now the last thing we're gonna to wanna to do before further testing is to enable SSH to our device. I'm gonna create a dummy interface specifically for SSH purposes. I'm choosing an IP subnet that I know are not in use on my current network. You can use the same IP as me, or you could use something like 10.0.0.1. Now I'm gonna limit my SSH to only the IP address. Let's compare the commands and then commit. Now that the initial configuration is completed, you're gonna to wanna to download a program called PuTTY on your host PC. To download PuTTY, you'll need to go to the URL at the top of the screen. I'll also put a link to this website in the description. Once you've downloaded PuTTY and you've started the program, you're gonna to wanna to SSH to the dummy address you just put in. For me, it was 10.0.100.1. Now here it's asking you if you wanna cache the SSH key, you wanna go ahead and accept. And as you can see, we're able to log in. We now have a fully functional ViOS router for home use. In the next video, we'll be adding network level DNS filtering using AdGuard. If you enjoyed the video, please like and give us any feedback or recommendations in the comments below. Also, if you haven't already, make sure you subscribe to the channel for the rest of this series and for future content.